We read from the Word of God this morning as it's found in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. Well, we'll read a part of 4 and 5. 2 Corinthians 4, beginning to read at verse 7. Paul identifies himself and Timothy as those who are writing this, and he just has said that in verse 7, we have the treasure of the knowledge of God that's in the face of Jesus Christ in an earthen vessel. So he's speaking about himself and Timothy, that their weakness in communicating the gospel, yet the gospel is the power, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed and therefore have I spoken. Theref we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look, not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this... We groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now he that hath wrought us for the self-same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. Therefore we are always confident, knowing that, that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. We stop in our reading of God's Word at that point. Notice that he spoke about the resurrection of Christ in verse 14, the bodily resurrection of Jesus. 14 of verse 4, chapter 4, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus 
shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. And then those verses, those first nine, eight verses in chapter 5. We're going to use that as the basis of the instruction that God graciously gives to us in Lord's Day 22. Lord's Day 22. This Lord's Day covers the last two articles of faith. Apostles' Creed has 12 articles. The last two articles are covered in this Lord's Day. What comfort doth faith in the resurrection of the body afford thee? That not only my soul after this life shall be immediately taken up to Christ its head, but also that this my body, being raised by the power of Christ, shall be united, reunited with my soul, and made like unto the glorious body of Christ. In what comfort takest thou from the article, Life Everlasting? That since I now feel in my heart the beginning of eternal joy, after this life, I shall inherit perfect salvation, which I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man to conceive, and that to praise God therein forever. So loved God the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Should live. Live? Where is Adam now? Where is Seth now? Where is Enoch? Where is Abraham? Isaac? Where's David? Where's Blake? Where's Sammy? Where's Miss Dykeshorn's father? Now. If they live with everlasting eternal life, is that only to come? What's now? What do they have? What's reality? What's life? These two articles imply an answer. But while they give us an answer, it's very, very difficult for a mind that, even though directed by faith, can only know and understand the realm of the earthly. Faith gives us to be able to know there's more. Faith is guided by the Word. And faith knows that there is the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. What's rather striking 
is that we t must take these articles of faith and not relegate them to the end as if they're not nearly as important as I believe in God and in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. The next question that we're going to have to answer in the Catechism is this, what does it profit you that now you believe all this? Not only God, Holy Spirit, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, but also the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. These are all a part of that which is to be believed. And then now in running ahead, the answer to the question, what's the profit of believing all this? That I, sinner though I am, and still will be, am righteous before God. The faith that takes a hold of those truths of Scripture that there is a resurrection of the body implies that there is a resurrection of the soul. Where's Blake? Where's Sammy? Immediately. As the body and the soul tore apart, the soul, to use Jesus' words to the repentant malefactor, was with him in paradise. He said it also in his parable. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and then look at the contrast, was buried. But the beggar, the believing beggar, Lazarus, died and was carried by the angels. Now, his body wasn't. His body stayed. And someone buried it. But he, he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. We consider the resurrection of the soul. An immediate activity at the moment of death. The fact that these verses substantiate for us the reality that there is immediate change, an immediate resurrection, as dramatic as we can conceive of the resurrection of the body when it arises out of a grave, when Christ returns, so dramatic is the change that has to take place in that human, also earthly, soul of a human. There must be a change so that it goes from the realm of the earthly into the realm of the spiritual, the heavenly. The heavenly. These, this truth stands over against different theories. There's a theory of annihilation, it's called. And those who hold to that theory believe that at the moment of death, it's an end. There is absolutely nothing that takes place afterwards. There's no heaven, there's no hell. That person ends. They don't, as the Buddhists think, get raised and put into the, uh, the soul or the body of an animal. This also puts to death Rome's concept of purgatory. 
If there's anyone who did not deserve to go into the paradise of being with Jesus, it would have been the thief on the cross. He should have, according to Rome's theory, been in purgatory for a long time, considering how he lived and didn't repent until the very end of his earthly life. But Jesus said, today, with me, with me, in paradise. Rome's concept that believers have to undergo a payment in the form of suffering later in the life, later after they die, is therefore no, no, not true. And also the concept that some have about soul sleep. And that is that the body is torn away from the, body, from the soul and the body is buried, but the soul remains in an unconscious state until the Lord Jesus returns. That too can't be if there's a consciousness on the part of the beggar Lazarus that is carried by angels into the bosom of Abraham. Or, as Jesus said to the thief, with me in paradise. So the Bible we are to take with the concept and the faith in the resurrection of the body to imply a resurrection of the soul that takes place immediately. Theologians, Reformed theologians, have put the name on it, intermediate state. Intermediate state describes the condition and the state of a, of a believer's soul from the time that they die until the time that the soul rejoins the body with, when Jesus comes again. Again, death is that horrifying separation of the body and the soul from each other. The soul cannot function without the body in this world. We can't conceive of how a soul can exist without the, the body through which it gives expression. And while that's a terrifying thought, yet now our faith in the Apostle, in the Word of God, assures us that in Philippians chapter 1, when Paul says, I don't know what I want more, I'm caught in a conflict of mind between two things. I, I, I would be to be, stay here to be with you, but I would also to be with Christ, which is gain. Gain. So by calling death gain, what otherwise is a terrifying thought, separation of soul and body, yet the Bible tells us through that expression that it's not a continuing pain. It's not a horrifying experience. It's something very positive. It's something that we need not fear. So that here in first, Second Corinthians 5, verse 4, in this tabernacle, in this life, we groan. But we groan in anticipation of something that is better. We want not to be unclothed, but we want to be clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Romans 8 says that we long, we groan and travail together in pain until now because we want to have the resurrection of our bodies. When one dies, then prior to death we have an experience of relationship with Jesus, with God. 
It's because the nature of God's relationship to us is so real and so powerful that at moments when we live by faith, not by sight, by faith, we grasp a hold of that relationship. He's our Father. He's our God. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. Those moments, however, aren't always... There are moments. And sometimes our faith isn't where it has to be. But the Bible is clear that as painful as the thought of death is, the experience of this relationship, His with us and ours with Him, is not lost but is intensified it becomes better so that second corinthians 5 again look at verse 8 confident i say and willing rather to be absent from the body and now to be absent from the body equals to be present with the lord to be present with Jesus. I will that those whom thou hast given me might be with me where I am, that they might behold my glory. John 17, verse 24. So when this earthly house is dissolved, now look at these first four verses, when this tabernacle, this body that is called a tent is dissolved we have a building of God now that now it's a building it's not a tent there's something about camping Uh, not in a motorhome not in hard sides but in a tent and then you go home and that's a whole lot better especially when you get a storm Now we want something with solid walls and a solid roof. We have a building. This building is not made with hands. And it's eternal in the heavens. When this earthly house is tabernacle is dissolved, and we've got something better that we anticipate. And that's the thought that we found in Psalm 73 as we sang it from 202. Through our whole life, well, from eternity past, when He elected us as very real people in His mind, and He gave us to Jesus, and our existence really began in the mind of God, in Christ. And as we were conceived and brought forth and lived our lives here on earth, we've been guided. Guided, 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 guided by his counsel. We thought haphazard. We thought God said, no, I was guiding you every second of the way. And then, guided by his counsel, and afterward, after that, immediately after that, received into glory. Gain. Relationship intensified. Richer better. Now that's why the scriptures, the New Testament scriptures say that when a believer dies it consistently says they are asleep. Jesus said it about Jairus' daughter. when there were those two, res- those two earthquakes at the time of Jesus' death and at the time of his resurrection. The first one opened the graves of the saints that slept. To the Thessalonians who were terrified because they didn't understand the last things very clearly, and they thought that if a saint died before Jesus returned, they were lost. 
the apostle writes of them in second in first Thessalonians 1 verse chap, chapter 4 the last part they are asleep in Jesus they're asleep by consistently using the concept they are asleep God was communicating an assurance that one this death and this seeming end is not an end. They're going to wake up. They're going to arise. It's not permanent. It's only for a while. Just like we might take a nap or we might lie in bed for five or six hours asleep. But we'll get up. The second thing that's taught us in that resurrection of the soul is that it's not only temporary but it's restful it's rest it's rest they are asleep means they're taking a rest it's not a bad thing it's a reviving thing it's a good thing and by using that expression what 1 Corinthians 15 calls the sting of death is pulled out. You get a sliver. You get a bee sting. And as long as it's there, even as tiny as it might be, it irritates. And you can feel it. But to pull it out, what a relief. So, they are asleep. Faith, not sight. Don't go by sight. By faith, they are asleep. Now, it should be obvious to us that though the Bible speaks very encouragingly about the death of a believer, that yet the existence that they have in paradise with Jesus is not what will be. Now, they made a huge step but they are not where they will be. They just have their soul. They don't have their body. And more than ever before, they will know what they're missing in the incompleteness of the body of Jesus Christ. It's one thing to have somebody die and you're far, far away and you can't be there. But to be back, to be there, and to be with others who have the same sorrow as you, you experience something that you find horribly missing if you're far away. The reality of the souls in heaven is that they have gain and they're with Christ. But nevertheless, they not only miss their bodies, they miss the other members of the body of Jesus Christ. It's incomplete. And Revelation chapter 6 tells us there's another thing that they don't have. Their consciousness of the injustices that were done to them is so great that Revelation 6 verse 10 tells us about the persecuted believers whose souls are as it were under an altar and they're crying in heaven they're, they're in paradise with Christ but they're asking the Lord Jesus how long O Lord holy and true wilt thou not judge bring the judgment on Christ and our enemies. They know that history is not complete and it will not be until their enemies are, persecu are judged by God Himself. So, there's a resurrection of the soul. So when we ask the question, they have life everlasting, where are they? They're in, they're in a relationship that that is far and more better than what we have. And they're safe. Their tears 
are wiped away. And best of all, they don't sin. They have no sinfulness that they have to mortify every second of their life. They don't have to put on any virtues anymore. They've got it. I believe in the resurrection of a soul. And I believe in the resurrection of the body. But that resurrection of the body, while there are some who have their bodies in heaven, Enoch, Elijah, Moses, those saints who were raised at the time of Jesus' resurrection, whose graves were opened by the first earthquake, they're in heaven. But they're the only ones who have their bodies in in heaven. Otherwise, there's a multitude of souls. And the resurrection of the body won't take place until Jesus comes. Marvel not at this. John 5, verses 28 and 29. The hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves, everyone in the grave, shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. They that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 tells us this. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. In fact, there's a time order given to us here. When Jesus comes, the first thing that happens as His glory floods the whole of the universe is that the graves are opened and this resurrection to life and to damnation takes place. And after the resurrection of those that are in the graves, then... We which are still alive when that happens shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And then this, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So the scriptures teach the resurrection of a body. And that's why the main reason why we read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. A tent. A tabernacle, that's the nature of our bodies now. Building, a building that's permanent. Now we groan, not to die, but to be clothed. We want that building. We don't want to be in, as it were, a tent anymore. In this tabernacle we groan being burdened. Now we fight sin all the time. Not for that we be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Now, kids, you know what mortal means? Mortality means death. Death is swallowed up in life. Death is swallowed up in life. That's why when you stand and look at a casket, an open casket, you really got to exercise faith. You have to see more than sight. That's why here it is. Of all places, we walk by faith, not by sight. And by faith, we take a hold of death is swallowed up just like a morsel of ice cream. Swallowed up in life. In Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle says, He will change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto His most glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able to subdue all things 
unto himself. And then those familiar words of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where it says in 43 and 44, the resurrection of the dead, it is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And the whole point of that is this. What you sow is so very different from what is raised. If, if we didn't have experience with gardening, we wouldn't understand that. But what you sow, a pea, a little round ball, green, put it in the ground. But the plant, a kernel of corn, How different from the stalk. An acorn. How different from those oaks. And a helicopter. How different from a maple. Sown one way, but raised in, an, in a way you just can't conceive. We can't yet conceive. Like his body, glorious body. But what that's going to be like? Faith, it will be. But now we walk by faith. Not by sight. We need our bodies. Now, we need our bodies in the everlasting life that's going to be given to us forever. We need our bodies in heaven as much as we need them on earth. God created us, body and soul, together. And body and soul were fashioned to have fellowship with Him. Body and soul. So the philosophers of long ago that said, the, the, the soul is in the prison of the human body, had it all wrong. Our body isn't itself sin. The lusts of the flesh are. But Adam and Eve had a body that didn't have those lusts. So we're going to have a body, not earthly, but heavenly, a glorious body. And we need that body because just as it is now, our soul exercises itself through the senses and through the body. So in glory, we need a voice to sing. Does the soul have a voice? Don't know. But we will need one then in that glory to come. Presently, our bodies are so earthly, natural, to use 1 Corinthians 15. Then they're going to be heavenly, spiritual. Then we're really going to reflect the image of God in soul and body. Right now, the image of God, according to the scriptures, is righteousness, holiness, and true knowledge of God. We have those, but they're tucked away inside in that regenerated heart. But then we're going to have it, and you're going to see it in the whole of the man, body and soul. You're going to see the image of God in Christ. And that's why we've been predestinated, Romans 8, 29, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Just as Jesus was a reflection of God, and in heaven we're going to see God in the face of Jesus. So we're going to be able to see God in the face of each other. So close is the union with Christ in glory. God miraculously and graciously will call our bodies out of the dust. If they're eaten by worms and left all scattered, like some hope to do with their ashes, in order to deprive any power of the ability to raise them from the dead. No, no, it will not happen. The power of God is greater than any man can 
to cause to prevent it. Jesus' bodily resurrection is the cause for our resurrection from the dead. Faith in Jesus' resurrection makes us believe that there will be not only a resurrection of the soul, but a resurrection of the body. And that will be followed with life everlasting. If you recite the Apostles' Creed at a grave, then in some ways when you get to these two articles, say it with a greater conviction and a greater volume than you said all the rest. That's when your faith must take a hold like never before at that moment. I believe and you're dropping that casket and you're burying it in the resurrection of the body and in life everlasting. Now remember what life is. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have life. You have life already. You are alive. And the evidence that you are alive is in the fact that God has given to you a regenerated heart that can exercise itself to say, if the Bible says it, I believe it to be true. Marvel, marvel that you have the ability to believe what the scriptures say. Marvel that you have the ability to believe that there was a man named Jesus and he wasn't just a human, he was at the very same time the Son of God. He's divine. Marvel that because the world is full of and has been full of people to whom God did not give that faith, that you can. That the little kids, you believe in Jesus. Now they've been taught, but we may believe it, just as we may believe that if God tears a child out of the womb of a mother, and those parents, since they knew that they were with child, prayed, prayed, and they brought that child to Jesus with prayer, then they have every reason to believe that Jesus said, Come on, don't you get in the way of, and forbid them to come to me. Now let that be a loud proclamation to every single one of us. Because if we don't bring them to Jesus in prayer, and God takes them from this life, then I'm going to want to doubt. Because I didn't bring them. It's by bringing them that we have no reason to doubt. So if there's a flutter of life in your womb before you even feel it, but there's other indications, start praying. Here, Jesus, this child needs forgiveness. This child needs life, real life. And if you take it and it dies earthly life, let it live by the grace, undeserved love. We pray, we bring, we have no reason to doubt their salvation. So that life begins in regeneration. That life is a possession of being able to talk with God, the ability to sit here and to hear Jesus. Got life. The real life. In this life, now here on earth, we know only a little of this life. That's forever. We have a beginning. Catechism says a small beginning, but it's a beginning. Pardon for, pardon for sin. 
a peace that endureth, bright hope for tomorrow, adoption unto children, so you can say, Father, Abba, And that spirit that's spoken of here in verse 5, we've got. And that's the promise that God gives. That's the engagement ring. And it's an engagement ring that God will not take away. We have the earnest of the spirit. We've got the life. So by faith, we look ahead. We've got to look beyond this life. There are times that we have great things and wonderful things and great experiences. But we have to be able to distinguish between that which is earthly and that which is forever. And that's why God gives us promises, but that's why He also brings crosses. And he knocks. And sometimes he pounds. To get our attention away from ourselves. Away from this earth. And to look up. To see a reality that's pictured here, but that's really forever. Promise to us is a future. That's a future with Jesus to share in all the benefits that he's earned for us. Death has a sting, no doubt. It's an enemy. But faith takes the sting out. We still carry the injury. And sometimes it's a scar, and it's not going to leave until we're raised. But he takes the sting out by faith. And the grave doesn't have the victory. It doesn't win. Our faith in the love from which we can never be separated, there's the victory. Now at the moment of death, there's an immediate participation in that glory with Christ. And then the enemy becomes a servant. We sit on one side, but there's more. There's another side. Death is the doorway we've got to go through. We sit here. We can't see the other side. But it's as glorious and as bright as that outdoors right now. What a day that will be. I believe in the resurrection of the soul. I believe in the resurrection of the body. I believe in the resurrection in life everlasting. Amen. We thank Thee, Father, for the hope, certain and sure, of an inheritance that's incorruptible and undefiled, that'll never fade away, that's reserved, reserved, far more certain and sure than any reservations we've made. Because we're kept by nothing less than Thy power. To Thee be the thanks and the glory, now and especially forever. Amen.